This is the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Accelerating Your Career. I'm your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer, where every other week we talk to someone about the role of power and influence in their life and in their career. And today I really am pleased to welcome a former student of mine, Rukaya Adams. Rukaya got her JD as well as her MBA from Stanford Business School and then has forged a career in finance. And for those of you who need to be reminded, finance has trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of assets under management, and fewer than 2% of those assets are managed by women or people of color. And Rukaya is a African-American woman, so she is a relatively rare breed in the world of finance and financial management. She has most recently run the Meyer Memorial Trust, about a $750 million operation of investable assets. She serves on the board of directors of Oregon Public Broadcasting and at one point served as the chair of the Oregon Investment Council, the board that manages close to $100, million, $100 billion pardon me, dollars for the Oregon Public Employees Retirement Fund. Rukaya and she and I were joking just before we started recording, was asked to run for the mayor of Portland. Um, unfortunately, they asked her too late, so she said no. But this is an extraordinarily talented and amazing human being who has had just a fantastic career and really also is a person of fabulous values. So, Rukaya, thank you so much for joining me today. What a delight to talk with you, Professor Pfeffer. You look very good. Thank you. Well, you know, it's amazing. Anyway, <laughs> so um, so I want to begin by taking you back. By the way, Rukaya is also quoted in my book, Seven Rules of Power. So I want to take you back to your graduation because you graduated during a recession, had uh, trouble, I think, launching your career. And I think out of that, uh, you learned uh, some lessons about power and how to use power to get yourself going. Could you talk about some of those early career challenges and what you did to overcome them? Sure. Yeah, I graduated from business school in 2008, law school in 1999. So I had almost a full decade of practice before business school. But when I graduated, the markets were declining we were just beginning to appreciate the seriousness of the great financial crisis and all of the opportunities I expected to have as someone who had nearly a decade of M&A practice under her belt, plus the quantitative training of business school. I thought I'd have lots of options, but when it came time to actually choose a job and find a job in 2008, I really struggled. I didn't get offers from any of the big firms, and my friends who were lawyers who were beginning to enter the partnership track were trying to tell me to come back to the practice, and I didn't want to do that. But after months and months of trying, I found an opportunity at a hedge fund in New York that needed someone who could both negotiate and count. And I just happened to be the unicorn <laughs> that they were looking for. And so despite my desire to stay in California, I packed up and moved to New York, to an entirely new place, and started over. In that job, I was in a new environment. Before that, professionally, I was in law firms. And law firms are very hierarchical and structured, very structured environments. Going into a hedge fund, it was more about talent and understanding how the business operated, how information flowed, what was valuable. And during that time, as a Black woman, I realized I was so rare in hedge fund practice. And over time, what I began to see was that my male peers had a different set of pressures and expectations that made risk-taking much more difficult for them. And I didn't have kids, I was unmarried and totally different than everybody else, so I operated in the environment differently than most of my peers. And what I learned was I became an information node. So all of the concerns that people had about what was happening in the markets after 2008, before we really appreciated what was happening in, say, 2009 and 10, if I had peers who were concerned about things, instead of being brave enough to speak up themselves, what they would do was tell me about it. And they told me, because I was already so different than everybody else, that I could raise the issue and not become a social pariah or be perceived as undermining anybody because nobody thought I was going anywhere anyway. So... What happened over time was that I ended up bartering critical information for both our investors and our senior managers. And over time, understanding that role 
helped me acquire power in the organization that led me to be promoted and to have the kind of experience that propelled me later in the career. Yeah, thank you. That was a great answer. And it really speaks to something that you said and that I wrote in Seven Rules of Power, that because you, nobody, as you just said, didn't take you that seriously, you were not perceived as a threat. And people would tell you stuff that they would not tell anybody else. That's right. Not even perceived as a threat. It was more like I was like some kind of weird animal, a unicorn of some some sense, like a magical little animal, right? And I, I don't think people perceived me as anything other than odd at that point. And so it was great because that meant that I could be staffed on really important deals. I could have important conversations with people who are much more senior to me and be in spaces and have people basically ignore me. And as a result of that, I got a lot of social and technical information that I used later. Okay. And so then after the hedge fund, how did you wind up in Oregon? And tell us something about how you then continued your career in finance. Well, this is where the, the personal and the professional intersect. So at the time I was dating someone who had lived in San Francisco and I was living in New York and I didn't want to stay in New York, but I wasn't sure that the relationship was ready for me to move back to San Francisco. And I got very sick. I don't know if I've ever told you this story, Professor Pfeffer, but I got very sick and had to have a surgery that was a life-threatening surgery. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like being near dead to clarify what's important to you. And that experience clarified a few things. The first was that I really wanted to be closer to my family. And the second was that I needed to make space for love. And I needed this professional life to have some capacity to to feed my spirit. And it felt to me like I really wanted to be back on the West Coast. Um, so that was the precipitating event that got me thinking, okay, I'm now 4,000, 3,000 miles away from my family. If something goes wrong, I'm very concerned about it. I'm also a runner. And in the winter in New York, I would bundle up and run from 131st and 6th in Harlem all the way down to Battery Park on 5th or 6th Avenue on the street. <laughs> and you know, you do that for a few years and, and you really miss running on the West Coast in the winter. So that was another factor that pushed me back to the West Coast. Um, and I opted to come back to Portland. I'm a fourth generation Black Portlander. My family's been here for seven generations. I hadn't spent very much time in Portland since I was 17 and went to college. And so I decided to take a little bit of a sabbatical in Portland to hang out with my mom and, and just check in on her and see how she was doing for a season. And that turned into 10 years later here. I'm, I'm still here, but I had no intention of staying. It was really just a desire to run through the winter on the Pacific coast or somewhere close to the Pacific to feed my soul. So it was something personal that brought me back for sabbatical. And once I came, breathed in the air of the West coast and of Portland in the winter, I felt like I needed to find a way to return to the West coast. But people often tell their career stories as this series of rational, professional, and analytical decisions. And the truth for me is that the most important inflection points are the ones where I was open to what my spirit needed. The analytical, professional outcomes followed clarity, personal clarity. And... Describe for us how you did, I mean, you were really very prominent, I mean, your work for the Oregon Investment Council and the Oregon Public Radio and all these other things. I mean, you were really extraordinarily prominent and a powerful individual. And describe what things that you've used from the class you took, because you give me sometimes, I think, way too much credit about how important that class was for you. What lessons did you take from the class that have helped you uh, reach such a position of prominence? Well, a few things. First is interrogating power is that puts you in an advantage from the start because a lot of women in particular are hesitant to talk about, think about, and engage with the idea of power. So just that step alone, I think, put, puts you at an advantage. It also helped me to be sensitive to the times when I had power and I was uncomfortable. It taught me to be sensitive about what I was thinking, how I was behaving, how I showed up. And I think just, just having that tuning fork about power helped. The other thing I would say, Professor Pfeffer, that I have thought about over the years, and I don't remember if this was explicitly in your materials, but power doesn't come 
with a lightning bolt. You know, I, I think people think of it as like He-Man, that one day you're on a mountaintop and there's a big lightning bolt and you get these bulging muscles and you get to shove everybody around. It doesn't happen that way. It happens over a meal. It happens in church basements. It happens when you help people. It happens when you carry groceries to someone's car because they have a bad hip. It happens slowly over time. And I think the thing you helped me think about more than anything is to really think long term about the small steps it takes to accumulate influence, which is the way that I think about power, and really mapping out where do I want to have power? Where do I want to use my voice? What are the little steps in relationships and skills and networks and professions that I need to have to make those incremental steps? moving toward being able to influence outcomes. What I didn't learn, Professor Pfeffer, is what it feels like when you get there. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't really aware of how influential I was. I knew I was taking those little steps. I had my plan. I was executing on the plan. But I, I didn't realize when I sort of crossed over into being influential. And it really wasn't until I got that invitation to run for mayor that I thought, oh, people are really listening to me. <laughs> Yes, people are, people are definitely listening to you. So if you don't mind, if you would talk a little about, I think you ran the Meyer Memorial Trust for at least eight years, and now you've stepped down. Do you have a sense of what's next and what caused you to, uh, to make this move? Yeah, so the number that you set out in the beginning of the program isn't quite right. So when I took over the Meyer Trust, the assets were $700 million. When I left the seat, they were around $1.2 billion, and we had given away about half a billion. So during my tenure, the net contribution was about a billion dollars of growth in philanthropy in the community. And I, I felt like that was enough. To run money with relatively few people in a business where you're the only revenue source, people don't think of foundations as businesses, but they are. They're investment businesses where the only source of capital is investment returns, at least for those that don't raise money. And that pressure over time was exhausting. In that business format, what happens is the investors generate the revenue that supports the business and is shared with the community. But our grant makers basically are on a party boat. And the way it felt was that there's a big party boat and my team was in the back rowing. And what I learned from that is if you're going to do this really difficult work over time, everyone's oars need to be in the water together. And so the realization that sort of slowly came to me is, even though I love the work, I want to be a CIO for the rest of my life. I need to be in the kind of environment when I say to everyone, put your oars in the water and friggin' row, people get them in the water and row. So that means being in an organization <laughs> where that is the purpose of the business is pretty critical. So that was the breakthrough for me. The other thing was that these jobs are containers, and starting the job eight years ago, the container seemed so big. There were all these things about being a CIO that I didn't know. I didn't understand the pastoral role, managing a billion dollars, how you calm someone who is the keeper of the billion when you're the CIO. There's a spiritual part of the work. I didn't understand any of that. The containment seemed so big and so exciting. Well, seven, eight years later, the container seemed small. I was spilling over the edges, thinking about investing not in purely quantitative terms, but years and years of doing calculus, first derivatives, second derivatives. By hand, the curves suddenly become art. They become something else. And I couldn't talk about new forms of capital. I couldn't talk about the ways that I wanted capital to evolve. I needed to just make the money. And so all of a sudden, the container felt small. And I felt like it was time to move on. And maybe my ultimate power move, Professor Pfeffer, is choosing to do that without certainty about the next step and to say that publicly. Mm -hmm. So you don't know yet what you're going to do next? I don't know specifically what I'm going to do next. I know it will have something to do with capital. And I know that I'll build a platform that will give me the space to talk about the ways that American capitalism needs to evolve, not just be in the day-to-day -day business of making money from money. Mm. 
That's a wonderfully powerful statement, and I like how you talk about that. And by the way, for people who don't know, CIO stands for Chief Investment Officer. And it sounds like a job that you did extraordinarily well at and that I'm sure you will do again. And the final thing I want to talk to you about, because you've raised it implicitly, but I want you to actually talk about it more explicitly, is in fact the challenge that I think successful women often face. Um, I still remember you sitting in my office and I don't even know, I, I didn't think we had that close a relationship, but you talked to me about how, as a black woman with two degrees from Stanford, 10 years of practice, you were concerned about being able to find a partner who would let you be you, let you be powerful, let you be successful, let you thrive and support your career rather than be threatened by your success. So if you don't mind talking about that evolution and how you found this person and, and kind of how you've integrated your personal life into your professional life, it'd be fabulous. Sure, this will be a nonlinear conversation, I, I think. The issue about love is so important. It's such an important business issue. I can't remember if it was your class, Professor Pfeffer, where the women were separated. So this tells you that it was a while ago that I was in business school because we certainly wouldn't have such a gendered approach today. But we were separated and there was a discussion about power and who we married. And there was a conversation where the gist of the conversation was basically who you choose to partner with will be the most significant business decision you make in your career. And I can't remember if that was your class, was it? It was. We talk about, I did a case on the, my friend Nuria Chinchia from ESA, and she had been in love with this, uh, you know, tall, handsome, blonde guy. And she was quite open about this in the case. She said, you know, he was nice looking and very attractive, but I did not think he was going to let me be me. I don't think he was going to be helpful for me in my professional career. And so she then married somebody else and she's still married to and very successful. So I think the statement you just made is actually correct, that one of the most important decisions you're going to make is who you're going to marry. And if that person is going to be helpful and supportive of your professional objectives or if they're going to, you know, get in the way and, and be resentful. Okay. So the way that I received that message was to turn it on its head. Instead of thinking about, in my case, man, um, as being supportive of me being me, I thought the only thing that could ruin my success is a bad marriage. So I made myself the protagonist in that situation and not the other person. And once I had that mindset, I started to think, okay, if the only thing that will inhibit my success is a bad marriage, then what do I need in partnership? And that standard became very high. And I was worried about people meeting it. Now, funny, looking back 20 years, I had no trouble finding good partners. No trouble at all. I think once I started to exude the, hey, listen, I'm not backing down energy, then it kept all the clowns away. And so I actually didn't have that much of a, a challenge with it. But the person that I ultimately ended up marrying is more of a compliment to my executive temperament and more of a compliment to my professional career than I think most people, most women think about, but I was conscious of looking for someone who would compliment me temperamentally, creatively, personally. And so he's a counter to me. He's thoughtful and introspective and reflective, and I am executive and analytical and direct. And so together we make a good pair, but I was intentional about it. And it wasn't so much that I was concerned that I wouldn't be me as much as I was concerned that I would be ensnared in some of the social expectations for women. I didn't want my partner to, to collude against me with society to prevent me from trying new things, from leading and asserting my ideas. And let me tell you why I want to do that, Professor Pfeffer. In Black culture, girls are not exempted from Dr. King's dream. He didn't say, I have a dream someday that my sons will sit down at tables <laughs> um, and uh, inequality. He, he didn't parse out women. And so I never had the sense that my expectations from a professional standpoint were different than my peers. I, I had the sense that my reproductive expectations were different, but not my professional expectations. So I had never had the, the mindset that I shouldn't. The other thing that I've come to see now that I control huge pools of capital I see the residue of slavery everywhere. I see it physically when I walk into banks in Europe and 
conference rooms have old printed issues of slave bonds in frames on their walls. I see it in the excess capital reserves in insurance companies that made a ton of money in reconstruction on newly freed Black people. I see it in exploitative financing arrangements, and it's everywhere. And the deep fire that creates for me as a CIO is that my people's bodies were actually capital, not collateral, capital. And 400 years later, I sit in a position of controlling capital. And over this period of time, people think of it as freedom. I see it as stepping from being an object in capitalism to a subject in control of capital. And as a result, I have something to fucking say about how we evolve. And I am not going to avoid saying that to conform to social expectations. So I needed to find a partner to help me talk about that, to get to a position of power that's big enough for me to start to assert a point of view about it. So that's the real story. Wow. That's a fabulous story. And I have to say, um, it's really a privilege and pleasure uh, to know you and, and to have had you come to my class over the years, uh, because as anybody who's just listened to what you said uh, would come to understand, you are not only a powerful person and a thoughtful person, uh, but a person with, a, with amazing values and integrity. And I really, really want to thank you uh, for being part of our podcast today. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. We've been talking to the amazing and just inspirational Rukaya Adams, who has just stepped down from her position running the Meyer Memorial Trust. And I'm sure she's going to do amazing things in the future, given her background and career. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's Pfeffer, P-F-E-F-F-E-R, on power. We are on every other week. You can read my book, Seven Rules of Power, and tell your friends about this. Again, thank you so much, Rukaya. You, you, you know, I have high expectations for my interviews. You have exceeded them by orders of magnitude. It's just really a privilege and pleasure to, uh, to talk to you today. It's a delight to see you, Professor Fever. Thank you for your time.